hello everyone. I am Muskan. I'm part of the growth team here at Vimo. To get started, if you already don't know Vimo, uh, we are a sales engagement acceleration platform. We help uh, financial enterprises across the globe improve sales processes, partner relations, and engagements. We work closely with over 60 plus leading enterprises such as AIA, AXA, Epic Credit in Vietnam, Berkshire Hathaway in the US. Uh, moving along to give you a little bit of context on today's discussion, small business insurance has been one of the most talked about areas of insurance over the past five years. But while the talk has been high, action has been quite low from most incumbent insurance. To capture the segment's potential, uh, insurers should keep several priorities in mind, right? And with the right strategy, the appropriate skills, and a suitable business model, insurers can offer SMEs an attractive portfolio that better meets their customer needs. Now, uh, this is a vast topic, and to cover all of this today, we have Ben To. Ben is the group head of bank insurance at UOB Group Business Banking. He looks after regional product strategy and development, partner management, sales and distribution, and digital transformation across five Asian countries. Before joining UOB, he was in multiple insurance companies such as AXA, Aetna, Chubb, and he has decorated achievements across corporate business development, strategic account management, data analytics, and digital marketing while leading regional and local teams. Um, thank you, Ben, for joining us today. Joining him is going to be Rajesh. Rajesh Sablok is our Managing Director, Asia Pacific. He has more than 25 years of experience in the financial services domain. Rajesh joined Vimo in 2019 as the Chief Customer Officer and helped, has helped transform the end-to-end -end customer experience journey through frameworks and processes and an agile target operating model. He also helms the customer-facing uh, teams, ensuring that we deliver tangible business outcomes and value for our clients, right? Um, before I hand it over to uh, Ben and uh, uh, Rajesh to take up the fireside chat, I would just like to inform everybody to... Um, if to ask questions on the Q&A section, if you have anything in the middle of the fireside chat, uh, Ben and Rajesh can take that up live during the webinar. And if uh, we run out of time, we will make sure to uh, get in touch with you offline. In the case you cannot hear uh, Ben or Rajesh uh, properly or can't see them uh, properly, if there, you face any technical issues, please put it down on the chat so that I can take that up and communicate it to the team. Um, yeah, I think uh, Ben, Rajesh, uh, you can take up the fireside chat now. Thank you. Thank you, Muskan, for the introduction. Welcome, Ben, uh, and uh, many thanks for joining us this morning. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to host you on this topic. Uh, from our previous conversations, I'm aware of some uh, stellar things that you've been doing in the space of SME Bank Assurance, and I'm sure uh, the, the audience today would be very happy to learn from your experience. So uh, over to you, Ben, if you want to have some few opening words, and then we can get started with our conversation. Sure. Thanks, uh, Mushkan and Rajesh, uh, I think, for the very kind introduction. So just maybe a bit of what I do. <clears throat> I'm currently at UOB. So for, I think, uh, participants from other countries, so UOB is United Overseas Bank. Uh, that is uh, one of the top three local banks in Singapore. We have a regional footprint. So for the segment that I belong to is a uh, group business banking. So we look predominantly uh, after our SME customers. So for my role, it's really to look after the sales strategy, uh, partnership management, digital transformation for five countries in Southeast Asia. So Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam. So very happy to be here this morning for this uh, webinar. And uh, if let's say you have any questions, feel free to just bring out in the chat and I think we can just address it as we go along. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. And, and uh, I think uh, we've been in several webinars and several seminars and, and, and what I've seen is, while there's a lot of conversation and discussions that happen on uh, retail bank assurance, uh, but uh, SME bank assurance is somewhat, I guess, uh, in a way, not spoken about too much. And I see there's lots of value that, you know, companies and people would get, uh, you know, discussing about what can be done. Now, SMEs uh, have been a backbone of uh, uh, economies. I mean, if you look at any country, be it uh, in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, almost 90-95% of their total 
employed workforce is in these segments, uh, SME industry, right? And, and they are contributing almost 50 to 70% of the GDP of these economies. So in a way, it's a very large base and, and they do have their unique requirements and, 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 and how are we able to su support them with respect to finance and insurance is a, is a very important, uh, you know, uh, topic. And I think today we will dive deep into this and, and discuss a few things around how can we support them. So starting up, uh, Ben, I wanted to check with you, uh, technology obviously has impacted every industry and uh, more so in the financial services space, but with respect to SMEs itself, why do you think these technology trends matter? And, and specifically now, why do they matter now? Hmm. Sure. I think when we look at SME customers, we cannot just look at them as a pure business owner. Uh, we must understand that actually for when it comes to handling SME customers, they are not the likes of a commercial or corporate banking card customers, large corporations with uh, every single person uh, very much into their specialized functions of whatever that they do. That SME can be a, a startup uh, for just one guy, one solo man business. It can also be a business which they hire like 200, 300 staff. But having said that, a lot of uh, business owners, when it comes to uh, working with us, um, they will really like the type of services that we can offer to them as a retail customer. So that's mm -hmm. actually quite similar. If, if let's say like every now and then when I look at market trends and one of my favorite sources is actually thing with Google, uh, Google already combs a lot of data. They come up with fantastic analysis. So I would recommend people, uh, a lot of our participants on the call to take a look at thing with Google. Um, you will notice that in terms of usage of financial apps, uh, banking apps have increased dramatically in the last two years and uh, largely thanks to COVID, the pandemic, people can't really go to a physical bank branch. So they started using the bank uh, banking apps more frequently. Now mm. in the last two years, the take-up rate, uh, adoption and usage rate of our UOB new to bank customers is 100%. Mm. Every single customer that came in in the last two years, all of them will use the digital banking app from us. Right. And um, I think it's also a lot of investment from our end to bring such digital uh, services to the for, to, for, for our customers to the extent that actually when we offer such services, it's really well appreciated and well received by our customers. So to that effect, actually in the last two years, we actually won the world's uh, best bank for SMEs by Euro Money and the Asian Banker. So, and in Thailand, when we first launched our uh, digital bank assurance product, uh, with our partner, MSIG, we also won the Best Customer Journey Award as well. So that is something I think shows a testament of what UOB is doing and also what SME customers really want from a bank. Excellent, Ben, and many congratulations on these awards. I think uh, a great work there and I'm sure many more uh, you would get in the future as well because I see that you're at the forefront of uh, you know using digital technologies for supporting the SMEs. So when it comes to uh, the sales processes, uh, specifically with respect to the SME, uh, you know, banking and bank assurance side of things, what are the current pain points that you 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 see in them at the moment, and and the way the bank is functioning? Hmm. Um, and this one truth to be told, uh, I think if you look at the customer standpoint, if I'm not in the insurance industry, I don't think about insurance stay here. <laughs> I I think. Maybe a lot of people on the call will be the people who actually think about insurance because it's, a, it's our job, it's our daily job. But really, if I dive into just one big point, how do I ensure my share when the buying moment arrives? Hmm. Because we don't talk about life insurance or personal insurance where maybe, okay, if I, let's say I have a new child in the family, I'll think about buying, let's say, like life insurance for my child. Um, if, let's say, for example, um, I get married, maybe I need to buy a home contest insurance or mortgage insurance. Those things come naturally. But when it comes to SME customers, no one has really charted a customer life cycle journey for the SME customer. And this is the part where I think is missing from a lot of uh, strategies. In fact, when I first came in, I was studying this and I also checked with my partners as well. Uh, we, no one has done this. So this is where we are pushing, uh, we want to be at the forefront of such a top leadership <clears throat> we want to really put customer engagement uh, with our SME customers as a number one priority. Uh, when do we engage the customers and why do we engage the customers at different types of milestones? So just to give an example in point, 
say uh, I want to engage a customer to sell employee benefits. It's a very relevant product for companies. But Correct. when is the right time? We will not engage them during the first year. We will engage them not at the second year, but at the end of the second year. Mm. And that's because um, in terms of statistics, nine or ten companies will go out of business after the first year. That happens for SMEs. But if you have been around for one year, you have been around for two years, likely you have grown your operations, you have some employees, and maybe that's the right time to have a conversation about employee benefits. The timing is, is key. Because there's no point in talking to a customer on day one or day, let's say, month three of their business cycle, they have not come to that, uh, you know, point where they need to make a decision on this. For them, it's more about uh, survival. How do I make money out of my operations so we don't trouble them with such conversations? Now, the second point, is uh, in terms of, let's say, product simplity, simplification. I think a lot of times when it comes to SMEs, uh, a lot of insurance companies, and I would say specifically for GI companies, mm. they always want to have a product that offers a catch-all solution. I can yeah. use this product to cover all industries. That is the wrong approach. Because mm. if you want to go on the digital route to dis distribute such a product, uh, and then you have, let's say, more than six questions, uh, I think we are doomed for failure. Because a customer who is buying such a product will likely have used Shopee, Lazada, Grab, or let's say uh, Tokopedia or Tiki in all the countries. Mm. They are so used to using two taps, three taps, and I buy a product. But now you ask me certain questions, like in uh, one of the countries where we develop a digital product, mm. uh, the underwriter was very insistent. I need to ask for the number of uh, fire extinguishers uh, in this so that it actually helps me to adjust yeah. the living rate. Yeah. But I said, as a, as a normal business person, I will not remember how many fire extinguishers I have in my company. So you are actually stopping the flow of the customer trying to key in some information just to get a quotation. I say this will, will ensure a lot of job off and it's true. It, it came true subsequently. Mm. On the last point, I have to make uh, in this uh, pain point that we're trying to resolve for our customer is we have to ensure that whatever we're doing is part of, let's say, like embedded finance. As long as it's part of the customer journey, let's say when I take out a loan from the bank to buy a property, you ask me to buy property insurance to cover my property in case something happens to it, I will buy it. If let's say I'm buying a machinery and I need to get a machinery loan and you ask me to buy some for machinery insurance at a point in time, I will buy it. I mean, of course, uh, the pricing must be reasonable as such, but customers understand the logic. It's just when do you pitch it to the customer? And that is very important. Excellent, Ben. I think uh, very valid points you made with the point about saying embedding your product as part of a, a buying journey that they have for a banking product uh, that they're anyway buying uh, makes sense because there the sales process is very aligned with respect to selling the insurance policy. Um, and, and likewise, you mentioned about simplifying the solution in terms of the uh, the ask that you have for applications, uh, information that you're asking for. So that basic minimum information should be able to, you should utilize that to underwrite that risk rather than getting a lot of information, which in fact means that, uh, you know, the, the salesperson may lose interest as in the client may lose interest and then they drop off the sales process. Now, very valid points. I think these are, and, and very interesting point you made about not aggregating everything on the one policy. And I think one of the reasons which, which your idea, which because of which this may not be such a good, uh, you know, approach for insurance companies to take is the fact that you're mentioning that you need to embed the product in a journey. So if you're having five different risks bundled into one policy, then they cannot be embedded in one journey. It, they are actually part of five journeys. So that is it's a very interesting point that you make, Ben. And uh, there are some companies I've seen where there are these uh, catch-all product uh, where everything is covered. Uh, and sometimes they find it easier where the insurance company feels, you know, just pay one premium, everything is covered. But like you said, it's not embedded. It requires a different sales process from that perspective. Uh, coming, going, getting along on, on the other points, uh, when I was thinking about, you know, from a transformation journey perspective that, you know, banks have to undertake and maybe even helping uh, your SME clients to undertake, what are the short and long-term values that are at stake uh, from that perspective? I think the short-term value at stake is always uh, meeting my uh, monthly budget numbers. <laughs> that is always the, the thing that actually stops us in our choice in terms of transformation journey. Right. Um, because actually, like since, let's say the beginning of this year, I've been running some strategic initiatives. Uh, how do we get data from our insurance partners, be it life insurance partner, GI or TV. 
I want the data to move into the bank's data warehouse <coughs> that we can have a good overview of our customer's portfolio. Along with the bank's data, can we aggregate the data, give us good insights? Then we can find a uh, better sales triggers to, to reach out to customers. But however, that took me maybe say six to eight months just to complete it across the region for five countries because there will always be a challenge. Um, the same person who is doing my sales, who is doing my product, is also the same party doing this. And we need to position it carefully. I need to still need my numbers and while doing this kind of strategic transformation concurrently. Mm. Now, having said that, that's just a... a, a Typical time constraint because of allocation of resources. Uh, but in terms of long-term values at stake, it's really about how do we stay relevant uh, mm. to our customers? How do we increase our productivity as well? Because it's quite common that uh, we don't increase a lot of headcount, but can we use the same number of uh, people to achieve better results? Okay. So I just use uh, one point over here, staying about staying relevant. I think in the last two years, I really read more articles about mental health, mental wellness. Um, so it's becoming an important topic, I think, in a lot of countries. Maybe in Asia, slightly more muted, uh, because I think Asians don't talk about this as much as, let's say, the, the Caucasians. But still, it's coming to the forefront. So at this current juncture, I really yet to see any insurance company covering uh, this type of benefits. They might offer it, but it's usually more of the bells and whistles they, they offer that comes along with every insurance company. But our view is that for bank assurance, we must move from protection to mm. prevention. Mm. If you have a healthy person, that person is going to be more productive at work. And that is our proposition of uh, to our SME customers when we offer their employee benefits. Mm. So how can they stay healthy uh, mentally, physically, and then they can be productive? So these are things that if our insurance partner is not doing it, we will actually talk to mental wellness uh, providers. So we will actually <clears throat> tie them up. Even if let's say our insurance partners are not doing this, we'll tie them up with the mental wellness partner. And we, it becomes a new bundle that no one is offering to the market and we can offer it to our customers. So that's one of the things that we're looking at. It must be something that will ensure that we can stay relevant before we offer it to our customers. Excellent thought, Ben. I think you're saying you are entering into kind of a partnership with your clients and you are actually interested in a long-term relationship with them and you're looking at ways in which you can help them grow their business by improving the productivity of their team as well uh, and providing them solutions from an insurance perspective, which, which are moving from a pure protection angle to a more preventative, uh, you know, focus, which is, which is very interesting thought. And I think it is it is, like you said, a very interesting long-term value that you want to drive for your for your uh, clients. Excellent there. And if I can, I can give one more example. Yeah, please, please, um, so in the, also in the last two years, you also noticed that actually there are more of a cyber crime yeah. happening. And yeah. a lot of uh, companies have been targeted. In the past, it used to be a case where a lot of uh, people, myself included, think that the hackers only target financial institutions because there's a lot of money, then you move it. But now they realize actually financial institutions have higher level of uh, cyber security. So now they switch the targets. Uh, I think we all of us about the large cases involving petrol chemical companies, or let's say the beef uh, producers in, in US. So they have to pay the ransom because they, all of them are stuck. I cannot move my shipments of goods elsewhere. And those are large companies. If you think about the poor SMEs who have right. very little money to, to pay for such cybersecurity uh, features for their company. So, and when you talk about cyber insurance, it's not a natural product that insurance companies want to push because they fear, oh, the risk mm -hmm. is so high. My mm -hmm. uh, combined ratio is going to shoot up through the roof. So, but to that point, we are also working with uh, cyber security companies. So they, it's something that we can offer the insurance. But the idea is that if let's say we offer something of value to the customer with such value added services, uh, the customers tend to trust us more. You're offering me yeah. something I need for my company at a very competitive rate. If I yeah. get it, I don't mind having a conversation about other types of risks that uh, I need to cover for my business. And the customers are happy to, to listen to us talk subsequently. 
Uh, definitely, definitely, and in, and in the in this day and age, uh, when you rightly mentioned, this is going to be, it can be a make or break situation for SMEs. I mean, if they have to pay such high ransoms, I mean, they may even have to shut up, shut their shop, right, uh, because they may not have that kind of capital. So you're right. I mean, this this is an interesting example as well of where you are able to create value for for your customers and uh, bringing together insurance and maybe out other vendors, creating that ecosystem which you're taking to the to the uh, to your clients. Excellent. With respect to uh, opportunities and threats uh, to SME insurance itself, uh, what what do you think? Because uh, tech is disrupting the industries. Do you see there are uh, you know similar threats that SME insurance line of business, so to speak, is facing today? Are there any challenges? And what are the opportunities? I mean, opportunities. I'm sure, given the size of the SME base is so huge today, we may not even uh, you know maybe at the tip of the iceberg with respect to what we are servicing today. So we have huge opportunity from that perspective. But yeah, your views on opportunities and threats to the SM, SME insurance line of business. Uh, I think I'll start off with the threats first. So in fact, the threat, I always view it is uh, actually more of the mindset of um, or the culture of a company. I think gone are the days when uh, every single insurance company or every bank needs to have full control or whatever that's happening. Because I think in the past, uh, the idea was always, can we just build something in-house? But mm. the cost of building something in-house is tremendous. Um, and there is always a lot of uh, pressure to deliver even on day one. So what I really advocate is, uh, I think all companies need to expand our horizons and build new partnerships. Can you build a mini ecosystem for yourself? <coughs> like just now, the two examples I gave, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Like say mental wellness and cybersecurity, this will never become a core business of bank. And I think likewise for insurance companies, like can you go out there and find the players who are the best in this field and work out a partnership with them? And this is really an area I don't really see a lot of people doing this, or maybe they might be doing this, but on the caveat, let's say like cyber insurance. Oh, if you take out my cyber insurance, I'll offer this product to you. Correct. But Correct. That is, I mean, if a, if a company will buy the cyber insurance to begin with, I think they know about the risk. That's why they do all this. Why not offer the free cybersecurity service first? Uh, it's really to protect the customer. And let's say the customer is willing to take out such a service, you also know it's better risk anyway. So, so it's really this kind of approach that we are taking right now because we want to build a halo of such a value added services around our core insurance products, which is the GI, Live, and EB. Then the second thing, um, for SME insurance, I think the opportunity is really massive. In the past, I always think that opportunity is large, but now I change the word, it's massive. <laughs> In the uh, last uh, six weeks, I've been traveling to the four regional countries, which I take care of, like, I mean, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And because I've been cooped up at home for the longest time since COVID, I've, ne I've not spoke to customers for a very long time. <clears throat> so when I went to visit these uh, four countries, I got my uh, local colleagues to arrange a focus group discussion. In every single country, I get to talk to maybe eight or 10 customers. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered, and also my local colleagues also discovered, you know, for a bank, right? Um, typically, we are quite happy to do a loan bundling of property insurance. The moment you get a loan to buy a property, it also ask you to buy the property insurance. And actually that uh, premium or revenue that we receive is still quite sensible. But mm. after the focus group discussion, we realized actually the customer is buying a lot of insurance outside from let's say a general insurance agent or let's say a broker. And the amount we're getting is a single dig digit percentage of their entire year's worth of uh, insurance sure. premiums that they're paying. So we never knew about this. We just think, okay, there might be some opportunity, maybe double or triple, but we didn't know it's like 10x. Wow. So that, that really opens our eyes. Um, and can we do better to acquire such businesses from customers? Yes, I don't think so. Uh, in fact, I would put a simple analogy to this. I think the general insurance agent, I mean, Kudos to them for taking care of the customers, but they are like a neighborhood mini mark. The, okay. the supermarket that is, you know, just underneath your block of flats, they can take care of you very well. And if, let's say they do a lot of personalization possible, but a bank or let's say an insurance company going direct, is like a hyper mark. We can always give you better selection, uh, better quality and better prices. 
And that's something that I will want to capitalize on in the days ahead of how we deliver such products to customers. No, no, I, yeah, excellent. So that that that's the the threats that you mentioned and the opportunities as well. Like you said, 10x opportunities because from a bank's perspective, given that you know they are actually getting it from agents where they may have limited choice, but as a bank, you could provide them a much broader range of solutions which meet their needs as well. Um, when it comes to uh, capitalizing on these new opportunities in the digital space, how do you think banks can go about doing this? Like you said, in this case, you did a uh, focus group con uh, discussion and FGD happened. You brought this, uh, you know, you got this intelligence and, and then there is an opportunity that you identified. But generally, uh, these new opportunities that you're talking about as well, in from the digital space perspective, how do you think the banks can capitalize on that? In the last 18 months, we have been uh, hard at work developing what I call GI microsites with uh, all the local partners we have in the countries. So currently we have launched uh, such GI microsites uh, with the partners in Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand. Uh, I expect Indonesia and Vietnam to launch their products by Q4 of this year. So that, then they will complete the whole tranche. Um, actually a lot of people are always get excited about such uh, new product launches, but going back to the hypermart uh, mm. scenario, it's just opening the hypermarket. You must ensure that you have weekly promotions, money engagements, or let's say coming out with newsletters to excite the customer to actually step into this uh, hypermarket. So that's why going back to the point about uh, customer engagement. So I think very early in this webinar, I mentioned that we have a customer engagement strategy. So from the day you set an account with UOB, uh, we have earmarked different type of collaterals that we will send to you in your email or let's say through SMS or even WhatsApp in some countries. Uh, the idea is that at different milestones in your customer journey with us, we will engage you with different types of products, different types of services, things that you didn't know exist, but now maybe you reach a certain uh, vintage with us, we will actually propose to you that you take us something. So there will be lots of banking products we offer. Bank assurance is part of it, how we can uh, you know, the customer can use our bank insurance product to better manage the risk of their companies. So that's one. The second thing is in terms of digital, uh, it's really not just about the front end. What about the support and data analytics that we can get from the data team? So we also look at the transaction data that a customer might have. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are able to understand their needs better. So a simple thing, um, we noticed that the customer just took up the payroll banking service through us. So that's the point in time where you know that definitely this, this uh, customer actually has quite a number of staff in the company. That will actually ensure that we push a trigger to our insurance specialist. This is the time to have that conversation about employee benefits. Mm. And uh, we can have that kind of conversations. And of course, all this is not just uh, started by say, some of our criteria parameters we will push this through a machine learning model so that over the course of time, this becomes automated. We always get better and better triggers and we can get more uh, effective face time with the customers when they actually desire to have such conversations. No, that's, that's excellent. And I think given the base of SMEs is so large and that's why I believe a digital framework to engage with these customers is critical because then otherwise it becomes cost prohibitive to have a large team go out and meet them. But the upper uh, segment of SMEs, like you said, where there are, let's say, 200 employees, which are slightly larger, I'm sure you have a field sales team as well, which might be reaching out and talking to these customers. So do you also have a solution which uh, which helps improve the productivity and makes them more efficient uh, when they engage with SME customers uh, physically, right? when they're meeting them and engaging with them and trying to cross-sell and upsell? Uh, so it's about sales performance management from the point of view of this team that is there, where, like you said, the technologies like machine learning or activity management or performance management can uh, help drive value. Or is this something that you're looking for or should be, you know, something which you should have? Just as a simple rule of thumb. So uh, for UOB, we service a few hundred thousand customers across the region, as many customers. Um, in all countries, we will break up the customers into different types of personas. So when we talk about personas, it can be uh, retailers, f and type of uh, businesses. It can be trading, wholesaling, mm -hmm. uh, manufacturing and construction. 
I, I know, I think for some uh, GI partners, they like to break up manufacturing and construction, but we lump it together. And then the last one is uh, investment holding companies. So that's at the first level, the type of industries that they fall into. Right. Subsequently, we also look at the amount of business that each customer is doing with us. So we will subclassify them into high touch and low touch customers. Right. So typically the high touch customers would be those with uh, larger accounts, larger businesses. When we use the um, data modeling, and then when we crunch the data, we pass the data analytics to our staff, we actually come in with the profile of the particular customer that they need to approach, the mm -hmm. type of industry, uh, the likely number of employees they have uh, in the company itself, and then also the personal uh, profile characteristics of the business owner, like his age and such. So, and it's not just about the data. We will also have uh, physical processes because for the high touch customers, we will have an RM that's tagged to this particular right. customer. Right. So this is where the RM will actually bring in the uh, insurance specialist when they go out for that appointment. So it's a joint visitation to ensure higher chances of sales closure. Correct. That's right. So the so I think the processes are there. Now the the like you mentioned, you're identifying high touch accounts, and so my point was that like you already said you may have an activity playbook as well as to what is the frequency at which you should be connecting with these customers. Amongst these high-touch customers, if you segment them saying these are hot and based on opportunities, hot, warm, cold, there may be a different set of activities you want to monitor for different set of uh, uh, you know uh, classified customer segments that we spoke about. So today, I mean, what Vimo does, uh, Ben, as you know, is uh, we are enabling customers to uh, they can, as in the uh, companies like yourselves, banks and insurance companies to segment their customers and identify a specific uh, activities playbook for each of these segments so that when you're approaching them, your performance is improved, you get data-driven insights like you're mentioning. So it is about driving the activities and productivity of this team, essentially it's helping the bank and the insurance company to increase their outcomes uh, that they're targeting using uh, technologies like machine learning and and uh, intelligence so to speak so yeah. i guess uh, you know that's something where you know we've been helping banks and others achieve the objectives like you're you're trying to do ben so yes, just yes. Uh, agree coming on the uh, you know the other question i had was on the specific uh, industry and premium sizes that you think are expected from sme business as i said we we, we are just scratching the surface at the moment. I believe there's a lot more opportunity here. So what is, what is your view? Hmm. Maybe just giving a very uh, simple example. So just now I mentioned that we did customer uh, focus group discussions in the countries. So just drawing, let's say on the example of Indonesia. So the typical SME in Indonesia, and to give a bit more context, uh, for UOB, we will bank customers with, uh, let's say up to two bill. Uh, to 2 billion in the Indonesian rupiah, that's around 2 million sing. Uh, yeah. That's the amount of loan that we give to them. And it will be for customers, usually with up to 200 employees in the company itself. So when we have that uh, discussion with them, so we're asking them, so how much uh, insurance do you buy um, for your business, very specific for your business. So the customer say, actually it ranges a lot. It can be say 100 million Indonesian rupiah all the way to 1 billion. Indonesian rupiah. That is huge. And the thing is that for the typical fire insurance product that we're selling them, only 5 million. So you can think about it, it's either 5% or 0.5%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so it's a huge, huge disparity. And I think the, the opportunities are massive. It's more in terms of uh, coming up with the right approach, um, ideally through machine learning model, ideally through a good sales CRM uh, system that can drive the sales triggers at the appropriate moment to have that conversation with the customers. Oh, definitely. And I think that's uh, aptly put. I mean, the sales CRM, a good sales CRM system with these uh, models, which can uh, ed educate and guide the sales team, which like we were discussing previously in our last panel, you know, which customer to approach at what time to approach with, with, with what product to approach and how to approach it. All of these answers, if a sales CRM system can provide, it improves the productivity of the team. Excellent. I'll just take a pause here and check if there are any questions, uh, Muskan, we have from the audience. We don't, but I truly encourage everyone to just put any questions you have on the Q&A um, uh, bar and, and, and I think Ben and Rajesh can take it up. I think 
But yeah, you can continue if if at all there are any questions, maybe I can interrupt or um and, and you know let you know the questions are there. That yeah, no, we we've had a great chat so far, and I think uh oh, most of the topics we've covered. Uh I'll, the the only thing now which uh, I wanted to touch base with Ben was on uh, you know, given we've discussed about the customers, we've discussed about the segmentation of these customers, we've discussed about their unique needs, and we discussed about how uh, you know uh, Ben and uh, has I mean uh, as UOB they have they have uh, kind of packaged these solutions, embedded them into the entire uh, you know uh, uh, customer journey today, and enabling uh, enabling the the SMEs to benefit from that process, and also educating insurers on looking at an ecosystem to be brought to the customer so that uh, you know the customer sees value in a uh, lot of things, including areas like mental wellness and and cyber security that we spoke about. Uh, so I wanted to now maybe quickly touch, we touched base on that as well with respect to how do we enable the sales team uh, to become better at what they're doing. So in terms of um, been from insurance company's perspective, uh, the kind of support that you're getting, is there anything you feel, I mean, if there will be some insurers on the, uh, on the, uh, who would have joined this discussion today. So if you have to give them, let's say three things that they can think of or do better uh, to help you know the cause of uh, increasing or improving SME bank assurance. What would your guidance be to the insurance companies? And I would say my my response would be quite broad because of the number, the type of products that I distribute. Let's say GI Life or EE. Um, maybe some driving principles because when it comes to SME SMEs, uh, to be very specific. It's actually a little bit different from the retail customer. So the retail customer, let's say you sell it through a bank, uh, most of the time we will only distribute, let's say, endowment or investment link products. That's a given. But when it comes to SME type of customers, if you talk about life insurance, right, we typically distribute more of the MRTA type of products. So all this, ideally, it will be a case where um, all the products should be pre-underwritten. That means right. as few questions as possible, it's really tech to the loan that the bank is providing to the customer. It makes things much easier. So that is more in terms of the underwriting requirements uh, for right. these kind of products. And where possible these days, we are also going on the route. We can offer loans to our customers on the digital route. If you are going to ask like say 10, 20 questions, because for the SME customer, it's not just about the personal health questions. They also ask about the financial questions as well. Yeah. Yeah. That becomes a, a true headache. The customers will just drop off. But where possible, collaborate with the bank partner, look at the type of financial questions we're asking. Can we pass you some of this data in order to underwrite the case? That would be fantastic. So that's, exactly. that's number one. Number two, when it comes to general insurance, as I mentioned earlier, it's really about product simplification, tailoring the product to the specific industry that the customer is in. Because it's quite different from a typical endowment product. Oh, you know, I have a age, uh, age pending, if you are 10 to 20, you are this premium, you are 30 to 40, there's this premium. It's very different because the yeah. moment you talk about different industries, they have different types of risk, but you do not have to have one product that does the catch all. The market, mm -hmm. the opportunity is sufficiently big. You can, you know, choose one, two, maximum three industries that you think are sufficiently big. It can target see 30% of the entire market. That's good enough. And uh, we can just go fishing for with that one particular product because by focusing your energies on one particular segment, we find that we actually get better results rather than a catch-all because it also takes time to train our insurance specialists or our sales guys on how to pitch it to a certain customer. And you're too many industries, they will also kill the sales force who's trying to do all this. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. So brilliant, Ben. I think that's a good advice for, for the insurance companies here. And maybe uh, one uh, last set, last question for me is going to be if there are, uh, you know, emerging SME bankers uh, in, in the audience today. So what would be your advice for how can they be successful in the SME bank assurance uh, space from a bank, bank standpoint? What should they be looking at? What is your advice to them? Or what should they be doing? If you talk about, let's say, digital bank assurance, um, I think too often, a lot of the business partners that come in, they just really solely look at the type of new products they can offer. 
that is insufficient in uh, today's context because it's not just about coming up with the best product. It's also thinking about what is the engagement strategy that we have. Because like uh, what I mentioned before, no one wakes up thinking about buying insurance, much less a business owner. He's more likely to think about how do I grow my revenue? Uh, how do I uh, manage my cash flow? How do I digitize, digitize my business? How do I expand my market share? Be it, let's say, locally or overseas. Insurance is never part of the equation. Um, so on that front, customer engagement, building mind share is extremely important. Now for a bank, whenever we reach out to customers, we provide, let's say, the latest market trends or what's going to happen in the market. Uh, let's say, you know, sometimes after the, the budget, uh, they, then we also talk about implications of how the budget will impact businesses, impact certain industries, what are the type of grants that you can apply for. Now, this actually helps customers to become closer to us because we are giving them new knowledge and, and you know, guiding them how they can improve their businesses and operations. So what an insurance company can do is also to do the same thing. Can you provide certain data uh, analysis about the type of risk that a company in the particular industry should be aware of I know broker firms are doing a lot of such analysis, but yeah. I don't really see as many insurance companies doing that. And the type of data that they can share with the bank to push it to customers, that is lacking. So I strongly encourage for, for insurance uh, companies to do something in, in this area, not just for GI companies, but also for, let's say, uh, live employee benefit companies as well. Oh, definitely makes sense, uh, Ben. And, and many thanks for sharing your thoughts and views and guidance uh, uh, which I think is going to be very valuable for the audience today. Uh, mm. So, uh, Muskan, I think uh, we are we are done with our questions. If there are in no more yeah, questions, yeah, there, there are two questions uh, okay. in the in the uh, section. I'll, uh, do you want me to read it out, Rajesh? Yeah, please. Why don't Why don't you? Yeah. Okay. So the first question is by Mr. Yoshihito. Um, how do you think about exploring group life insurance starting from SME bank, uh, bank assurance? Life insurers are keen to exploring SME market by providing some support services related to HR functions. Okay, I will try to answer the first part of the question. The second part, it seems more like a comment. I am not quite sure what are the support services uh, that you indicate that is related to HR functions. So I'm not quite sure maybe you can uh, give a bit more details, then I can address that. But in terms of uh, offering group life insurance starting from SME bank insurance, that is uh, something I would definitely welcome. It's just that in terms of the product structure, when you talk about group life, a lot of uh, life insurance uh, partners will always look at, if I offer a group life, is covering a company and plus all the staff in that company. I believe a better way to do this is when you pitch it to the bank partner, offer this as a group program that covers all the SME business owners. Because typically a company, when they come in uh, to set up an account, it's usually the business owner for SMEs. And if not one of the major directors, because they need to do the form signing. If you can have such a group life product that covers either the business owner, or let's say all the major shareholders in a company, you actually can capture a larger portion and this can always be bundled as part of, let's say, the account opening or let's say the loan facilitation process. When you bundle any insurance product with a bank product, you will likely get better traction. So that, that, that's, that's my recommendation. I'm not quite sure about the support services, so I can't address that. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Ben. I hope uh, the question is answered. Uh, the second question here is, while there are vast opportunities that SMEs provide, what would you say the risk factors are? Mm, okay, for this question is pretty broad <laughs> uh, because you didn't describe the vertical they are talking about, let's say live, GI or EB. Um, it really goes down to the type of industries you are covering. One of the approach that I have adopted in all the countries when I talk to my GI partners, I would typically say, look, which industry are you, uh, do you feel more, most comfortable with? That means the, where you have a lot of risk appetite to insure that industries. I have here partners, let's say like in Singapore, they say we are very comfortable with construction. We have a large portfolio. We don't mind adding on more because 
the risk pool is, is solid. I have uh, partners in other countries saying we are better at marine cargo. So sometimes it helps to share your preferred areas, uh, your, where, where you're good at with the bank partner. Then this is where actually you can dive in and say with your product expertise in one vertical, the bank maybe have customers in this vertical, you go in there. So this, I think, is where you mitigate your risk factors because like what I mentioned earlier, when you try to create cash flow products, uh, you're trying to ensure a lot of risk and some risks might not be what your underwriters have appetite for. There's no need to pursue them because uh, you, let's say you are working with a suitable size uh, bank partner, there are sufficient opportunities for you to capitalize on. There is no need to cover everything. And by that, I think your risk factors will be much, much lower. Okay, uh, the last question there is, can you share examples of how product personalization has helped seen an uptake in conversion? Hmm, sure. So uh, in the context of, let's say, our digital product in Thailand, so when we first launched it, and also coming back to the points I, I think I might raise earlier, we specifically only target the retailers, the FMB, uh, operators and also the small offices. So anyone else, let's say that's in manufacturing, construction, or other types of industries, we just don't cover them. But we did a study of the market by covering these three types of uh, sub-industries, you will actually be looking at, let's say 30% of the entire SME population in Thailand. And this is also the number of customers in our books as well. So when we crafted that, we also look at what are the possible um, upper limits in terms of coverage for such businesses. Uh, we were thinking that maybe let's say up to 10 million Thai baht would be sufficient. So this is where we draw the line. Instead of having a full universe set, we actually draw it that we only cover uh, companies in these three industries up to 10 million. And then all the benefits that we push. Now, let's say in the SME uh, bundle insurance product, usually there are up to six or eight benefits. In some countries, they also offer up to 10 benefits. But when I talk about product personalization, it also doesn't mean that we purposely cut off certain benefits that might be relevant to a customer. Uh, it's low incidence, but we just kill it off. But that doesn't protect the customer. It's also in terms of how you position the product and how you market it to the customer. So we will actually showcase three of the benefits that are most prone to claims. Because whenever we pitch a product, you know, we expect the customer to read through every single line. That is not the case. A lot of times customers only read about things that they're interested in. So in the case of, uh, let's say the product we launched in Thailand, we purposely featured uh, things like coverage from say flood, from a wind and hail storm upfront. Uh, because these are the, the benefits that receive the most claims. So these are relevant to customers. They read through it, they like it, and then they make a purchase. So this has also helped us a lot uh, in ensuring a good customer journey, which uh, we have received a customer, the best uh, customer journey award in Thailand. Hopefully that addresses your question. Yes, I think it does. If no one has any more questions, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you so much, Rajesh, for um, holding this Thank conversation you. up. I think it was really insightful for people. And, um, you know, it, it has been really, really interactive. Even I got to learn a lot about the SME industry that I didn't know before, right? Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, this has been great, Ben. Thank you so much for coming along. Um, uh, for everyone who's attending, we will be sharing an email with uh, a recording of this webinar that you can refer to offline uh, and share with your peers and colleagues uh, every insight that you've learned today. And thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, everyone.